Hey, I'm Brandon, the online campus pastor here at Big Valley Grace, and thank you for taking a moment to watch this message. It is the teaching portion from one of our live weekend worship gatherings, and we have those every single weekend here online and in person, and I just want to extend an invitation to you to join us. We're just a local church, local body of believers, and we would love if you would join us uh, on a weekend upcoming here sometime soon. Uh, but as we get headed into this message together, a couple things just want to point you to. One is a connect card. If there's any way that, that we can pray for you, if you want to contact us, that connect card form is just a really great way uh, to let us know that you're joining us. Any next steps you want to take, stuff like that is right on there. Also, if you want to bring an offering, a worshipful gift uh, to King Jesus, you can do that right on our give page on our website or via text. So hope you enjoy the unpacking, the unfolding of the word as we look at it together. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 15 because we are going to start a little series here that really is designed for those of you that made decisions last weekend. And uh, last night here, I met a number of people who last weekend was their first weekend here and they actually gave their life to Christ. And, and that, that might be you, that might be you online. And so this uh, little mini series is really designed for you but all of us who know Christ, we'll all benefit from it, I guarantee you. But before I get started, um, Pastor Joel and the elders of the church have asked me to make an announcement to call our church to action. We don't do this very often, uh, but when we do, it's a, it's a pretty weighty, weighty deal. Um, as most of you probably know, our governor, uh, Governor Newsom, who's a Democrat, wants to make California a sanctuary where people can come here and have uh, their babies killed. And where, where if you're from another state, come here, we'll put you up in hotels and we'll feed you and we'll, we'll pay for you to have your baby killed. Some people call it an abortion. I don't. Just, I just want to call it what it is. And to that end, there is um, a gal by the name of Buffy Weeks. She's a Democrat out of Oakland. Uh, she sponsored a bill called AB 2223. Whenever you read that AB, it just means assembly bill, AB 2223. And when it was first written, basically that bill uh, communicated that you literally, a mother, and I, I hate to use that term, but a mother could come to California and up to 28 days after that baby was born, you could kill it, okay, in, in, in fantasize. Well, it was a poorly written bill and they're working really hard to reword it and all those things and that's what, what, they, what they do in the assembly. But the point is, is that you, you can kind of catch what the, the flavor of it was, the feel of it was. And so what we're asking you, our church family, to, to, to do is to take some action on AB 2223. And what is that action? I'm going to give you a couple of things. And what's interesting is before the elders ever got a hold of me on my podcast on Wednesday, I talked about AB 2223. Uh, here, here's what we got to do. Here, here's the first action step we all take, and that is to pray Praying is the greatest weapon that we have. Our brother James tells us that the prayers of a righteous person, the prayer, prayers of a righteous man, a righteous woman, they're, they're powerful and they're effective. And so the first thing we gotta do is we gotta pray. It's the greatest thing we can do is pray. But there comes a moment when you kinda gotta get off your knees and you know, take some action. And the next thing we, we, we do is we contact our local representatives. And we have a sheet of paper that the elders and pastors have, or Joel have put together. It's called an update call to action. You can pick it up out in the information center and on it, it'll give you a little bit more information on AB 2223. But it also more importantly gives you all the names and phone numbers and email addresses of those that are in positions to um, uh, craft laws, make decisions, okay? There are, there are people in, in power, if you will, and uh, there's a whole lot of those folks on this sheet of paper. We want you to pick one up and, um, and email those people, uh, call those people, uh, send a snail mail to those people, 
Uh, text those people and let them know about your opposition to AB 2223, okay? The third thing we want you to do is some of you are, you're hearing this for the very first time and so what I'm doing is, is I'm, I'm, I'm using some influence just to let you know about something. There's a lot of people out there that have no idea that this is even making its way through our state government. And so if you would use your influence. You, you may have a Facebook page that has five people that follow you. Well, that you can influence five people. Maybe you got 100 people that follow you. Maybe you got 1,000 people that follow you. It doesn't matter how many you have, or it could be, uh, it, it, you know, it could be Twitter. It doesn't matter what it is, but if you would just let people out there, would you influence those around you and let them know about this crummy evil uh, bill that's out, out there? That would be uh, another action step. And I'll end with this. Um, we have to do it as believers in a, in a God-honoring way. And that's where things can get tough because something like this, when babies are being killed, you know, I, I, I just want to go ballistic. And I have to remember that I'm a follower of Jesus. And we have to do it in a kind and caring way. And, and the illustration that I think I'll use to help us maybe see how we can talk with others about it, how we can influence others about it is what took place on Good Friday. On Good Friday, we have Jesus who was beaten to a bloody pulp by you know, a bunch of Roman soldiers. These Roman soldiers whipped him, they put this crown of thorn on his head, they put him on a cross, they're driving nails into his hands, they're driving a nail into his feet. The cross was a bloody, bloody, bloody mess. Thank God, because it's the blood of Jesus Amen. that cleanses us of our sins. It's not his teachings. It's not the fact that he was born. It's not his miracles. Those just proved who he was. But it's the blood that cleanses us from his, our, our sins. But here's this bloody scene, and one of the last things that Jesus says is he looks down at these Roman soldiers, these ones that had beat him up and you know, whipped him and, and, and put this crown of thorns on his head and put these nails in his hands. He looks down at the very people that had done this to him and he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Wow. That is an incredible attitude. I expect unbelievers to act like unbelievers. I expect unbelievers to sponsor evil bills. I expect that. They're unbelievers. They, 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 don't, they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're blinded by sin. They're, they're blinded by their unbelief. And Jesus understood that. And uh, I'm sure he was hoping that, you know, when Sunday rolled around, that maybe the 12 guys that he had poured his life into would be able to go and evangelize those Roman soldiers and tell those Roman soldiers about Jesus. And one of the things we want to do is we want to stand against evil, stand in the gap against evil, but we got to do it in a way that somehow honors the Lord, and that's not always easy. And so, please, when we're done, just go pick one of these up. Pray, 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 pray. And then say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna call somebody. I'm gonna email somebody. Influence those around you, but always remember to do it in a spirit of love and compassion and maybe the illustration of Jesus on the cross dealing with those that had put him up there might, might guide you, okay? So Lord, thank you for a chance to gather and look at your word. Have your way with us, Lord. I do wanna pray for our governor, Buffy Weeks. God, pray, God, that somehow, some way, you would work in these people's lives. Man, I hate to think just the evil that things like this can per be perpetrated on little tiny babies. So we need you, Lord. Bless our time, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So as I said, um, one of the things that Joel wanted to do was, okay, it's after Easter. All these decisions were made for Jesus, and 
Let's maybe help uh, those new saints understand a little bit about what does it mean to be a believer? Now, now that you've given your life to Christ, you know, what, what does that mean? Now that the Holy Spirit lives in you, what does that mean? Or, you know, you, you got off track and, you know, we're living in a sinful way and whatever, and now you rededicated your, your, your life to Christ. And when you rededicate your life, that just means that you were living in a crummy way. Something, something happened and, and now you're saying, hey, you know, God, I, I, wanna, I wanna follow you. And for those of us that have walked with God for a long time, it would be a great reminder. What does it mean now that I'm a believer? Because the greater your understanding of who you are in Christ, now that you've given your life to, to, to Jesus, the greater the chances are that you'll live a fruitful life. The more you understand about this new life in Christ, what it means to be in Christ, what your identity is in Christ, or however you want to word it, makes a difference in how you're going to live. For instance, if, if you think you're a loser, I'm a loser, you know, the chances are pretty good you're going to act like a loser. The chances are pretty good you're going to want to hang around a bunch of losers because that's the way you see yourself. If you see yourself as a victim, then you know what? You're, you're, you're probably going to hang around with people that, you know, just find themselves being victims. And you're just going to carry yourself as a, as a victim or whatever. If you see yourself as uncreative, the chances are pretty slim that you're going to even try to be creative, because you don't see yourself as created. On, on the other hand, if, if you see yourself as successful, the chances are pretty good you're gonna wanna hang around or even hang around with successful people and the chances are greater that you'll actually be successful. If you see yourself as someone that's been forgiven by God and deeply loved by God and a child of God, then the chances are pretty good that you'll live appropriately. In fact, there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies done at major universities on this topic. How you see yourself matters. How you see yourself determines to a great degree how you're going to live your life. And one of the things that's interesting is it doesn't take a, you know, university study for us as believers to understand that because thousands of years ago in the scriptures, God penned these words. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. That's Proverbs 23. For as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? What what you think about you matters. What you think about you know your life, man. I'm telling you, it it it, it impacts you in ways that you have no idea. Warren Worsby, who was a really great theologian, said this: You may not be able to see your thoughts, or weigh your thoughts, or measure your thoughts, but that doesn't mean they're not real and powerful. Man, there's stuff up here you don't even know that's up there. Stuff that's been taught to you when you were a child from your parents, your grandparents, teachers, professors. Man, there's just all kinds of things up here that are stored in this wonderful thing called a computer. John Maxwell, another great Christian guy, he said this, what occupies your mind and what you think about means more than anything else in your life. Wow. Now, that's not scripture. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's a powerful thought from a very mature believer. Dr. MacArthur said this, spiritual, spiritual stability is a result of how a person thinks. The Bible leaves no doubt that people's lives are the product of their thoughts. Wow. And what you 
think about yourself matters. And, and so I was really thankful that Joel said, hey, why don't we do a, a little series where we look at our identity in Christ. What does it mean to be a believer or a follower of Jesus or whatever word it is you wanna use? Because I think he's on to something. There's an old saying that goes garbage in, garbage out, right? Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedience to Christ. And what Paul's basically saying there is this, is that there will be times in our lives, could be five minutes when you walk out of here and you get in your car, stuck in a traffic jam, maybe you're on your way to work, I don't know when it'll be, but there'll be a thought that'll run through your mind. And it's an evil thought. It's a wicked thought. It's a, it's a crummy thought. And we all have them. I don't care how long you've walked with the Lord. And so what Paul's saying is, is you know, I don't know, you're driving down the road and, and, and somebody cut you off on the freeway. And, you know, and you, you, the thought is, I'm gonna run the you know, my car right in the back of that guy. And what Paul's saying here is, whoa, 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 whoa. Take that thought captive. Is that thought from Jesus? Is that a biblical thought? No, that, that is, you take it captive and you go, whoa, not, not acting on that. Because that's a thought that's coming from a crummy place. That's a thought that's coming from my flesh. That's a th thought that's coming from my Adamic nature, the old nature, whatever, whatever word you wanna use. But you need to make sure you got good thoughts up there, biblical thoughts up there to replace it with. So here's what I wanna do real, real quick. Is I wanna give you three fundamental truths that all of us need to know, but especially those of you that um, are new believers. Especially those of you that maybe you got off track and I don't know how it happened, but you didn't take thoughts captive. And those thoughts just kept piling up and before you know it, you showed up here last weekend or you showed up in series or you're watching online and you went, man, you know what? I'm so far away from the Lord, I gotta rededicate my life kind of a thing. I'm gonna give you three fundamental truths that we all need to know. These are things you need to have in your brain. And the first one is this, is that God created everything. And that includes you. Genesis chapter one, you go to the very first book of the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I've often told you I, 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 in chapels that I do, when I go places and speak, and I speak at lots of different things, um, I will often talk about the most important words in all the Bible are the first five words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. To me, there are no more important words than those five words, because if you can't get past the first five words in the Bible, then the rest of it really ain't gonna make a whole lot of sense. That in the beginning, God created. He created out of nothing, ex nihilio. Out of nothing, God created. And by the way, that's one of the things that secular scientists and Christian scientists have in common. Secular scientists believe that out of nothing, everything was created. That there was a time when there was nothing, and then bam, there, there was something. Well, we believe the same thing. Christian scientists believe there was a time when there was nothing, and then bam, there was something. Ex nihilio, God creates out of nothing, everything. They don't know how it all started. They just tell you that bang and then billions of years and here we are. They, they just, they haven't found the answer to how it all got going. Well, we know how it all got going. 
It was God who ex nihilio, out of nothing, created everything. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we read about all the things that God created. The reason why we are creative as human beings is because of God. He's creative. Now, we don't cr create ex nihilio. If somebody sits down and creates a beautiful painting, they're not creating that ex nihilio. They're using the color green that God created, the color red that God created, the color purple that God created. They're using the canvas that God created. They're using the wooden you know, brush and the goat hair, whatever it is. We are creative, but we don't create ex nihilio. Only God does that. But then you get to the crown jewel of his creation, and it's us. It's you. Yes, God created goats and cows and lizards and, and bald eagles and trout and worms. He created it all. But when he got to human life, he created us in his image. A goat isn't created in God's image. A cockroach is not created in God's image. You are. That's what, that's what, you know, makes human life different. It's why we stand up here and tell you about AB 2223. There's not gonna be, and I'm not gonna stand up here and go, hey, there's a new bill that says you can't go out and kill cockroaches. We've made California a cockroach sanct you know, sanctuary state. We're not gonna do that. We do that because we know that human life is sacred. It's valuable beyond anything else. So we'll stand up here and go, use your influence. Pray, please, that we don't kill more babies. Got to, got to, it's just crummy to even think about. So the first fundamental truth I want you all to know and understand is this idea that you know, God created everything, and, and that's you. He created you. But the second one, and they kind of go hand in hand, is this, is that God custom designs each person. And that, that includes you. The Bible says in Psalms 139, you, this is a, a man by the name of David. He was a king, and he's talking. He says, you, that's, that's God, God. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. And King David had no idea how complex we are. He didn't have microscopes and, and all that kind of stuff. But man, when you leave here, just Google your you know, eyeball and just look at it and go, whoa, man, am I wonderfully complex. Google, I don't know, spleen. You are wonderfully complex. When you were inside your mother's womb, he knit you together just the way he wanted you to be. Listen, don't ever let any biology teacher or professor or any parent tell you that you're, you're an accident because you're not. You may not have known who your parents are. But what God knew was that egg that had those 23 chromosomes and that sperm that had 23 chromosomes, when that egg and sperm came together and there was life, that those 46 chromosomes that were made up you, he had a plan for it. Hey, look, there are accidental parents. My parents, I, I was an accident. I have a sister who's 14 years older than I am. And when I came along, it wasn't the plan. And I can remember being 
four or five years old in my, my bedroom and I would hear my mom and dad out in the living room talking about, you know, my dad was upset because, you know, mom, my mom wasn't using birth control or whatever and all of a sudden little Ricky comes along and now they're not gonna be able to do their retirement or whatever it was. And then I was a mistake and I didn't hear it. And by the time I'm six, it became such a bummer to them that they divorced. They were accidental parents. Listen to me, listen. But there's no such thing as an accidental baby. There are accidental parents, I get it. But if God allowed that egg and God allowed that sperm from whomever they came from to get together, that was planned by God and you are unique. There's some sort of purpose that God had for that egg and that sperm to get together. Some of you don't know what that is. I get it. And this is a church that will help you. Last night, Pastor Alan Boone sat right, right, right there. He's running around in here. I'll just tell you, one of the things that gives him great joy is to meet with him. And guess what he helps you do? He helps you figure out what is it that God had planned for you? What is it that God wanted you to do? He allowed the egg and the sperm to come together. He created the life inside you that's wonderfully complex. And it's okay that you don't know. We'll help you figure it out, but I just want you to know, even if you don't know, it's a fundamental truth that not only were you created by God, but he created you for a specific purpose, okay? The third fundamental truth, and this maybe gets us into our text, is this, is that the moment you surrendered your life over to Jesus, God gave you a new identity. A lot of amazing things happened last Sunday or Saturday night here in this building or online or at series. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, wow, I I could preach a thousand messages and not be able to tell you all the things that took place at that moment in your life. But one of them is, is that you got a new identity. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And he's not talking about this. This isn't new. This thing just keeps getting older and older and I got sores and things and my eyes are going bad and I can't hear hardly. This thing, he's not talking about this. My dentist is right right down here. My teeth are, I don't know. I know, I need to floss more. I, 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 you know, I get it. I, and I do, I floss every six months when I go in and, and I, the, the lady goes in and does it. So I, I, I'm, I have, I'm on a schedule, a six month schedule, doc. Um, This is old. He's not talking about that. That's not what, this isn't what becomes new. It's what's inside your spirit. That's what becomes new. Because now God, through his Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. Unbelievable what what takes place. So, what is your new identity? Well, I'm gonna give you one thing. Okay, there's a whole lot of things, but I'm gonna give you one, and this gets us to uh, John chapter 15, okay? So you're all there, look at verse one. And this is so simple. I, 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 I hope I don't screw it up. I've been known to screw some things up when I'm preaching. There are times I've gone home on a weekend and gone, man, how did I mess that up? But I did. <laughs> It's just did. It's like, oh man, sorry God. I'm sure God sometimes has been in heaven going, how'd you mess that up? <laughs> that's, just, that's, just, that's just simple and you, you mess the whole thing up. You know, I've asked God to help me not mess it up, trust me. So look at verse one. This is Jesus talking. He says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener, Okay. God, the Father is the gardener, and Jesus is the vine. 
He's this, this big, thick thing here, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna keep going. Number verse two. He, that's, that's the father, the gardener, cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more, okay? Now, he's not talking about salvation here. You can't lose your salvation. If you blow it, he cuts you off. This is a text about fruit, bearing fruit. So, so a lot of people goof this text up. No, let's see, you can lose your salvation. No, you can't. If you can lose your salvation, there's no such thing as good news. Trust me. If you could lose your salvation, you would! Your, your sinful nature is so powerful, you would lose it, but you can. He's talking about producing fruit here. Look at verse three. You have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. Okay. In other words, Jesus is saying that you're, you're saved by the power of the word of God. You are purified by the word. Peter says something similar in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. When you obeyed Jesus. When, when you gave your life to Jesus. Okay. Verse 4. He says, remain in me. Some of your Bibles say abide in me, uh, commune with me. Some will say obey me. And I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Those that remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. So, Got God, the Father. He's the gardener. You got Jesus, right? He's the, he's the vine. And, 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 and we're, 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 we're this branch, right? Now, here's how simple the illustration is. This is done. This cannot produce fruit anymore. It's done. Still looks pretty. In fact, I was talking with some farmers who will tell you that when they prune branches, they'll start to bud, even though it's not connected. You'll see a little life. It still looks good. But that, that bud isn't gonna do anything. This is now done. It is done. It cannot bear fruit. It's impossible for this to bear fruit. It has now been disconnected from the life source. It's done. Jesus said, God the Father is the gardener. Jesus said, I'm the vine. And here's your new identity, young Christian. You're this. You're a branch. That's what you are. And if you really understand that you're nothing but a branch, you'll understand how important it is to stay connected. You're toast. You can, produce, you can produce fruit. I'm a loser. Right, I can produce fruit. What's amazing to me is that branches can walk around thinking that they're doing something amazing for God. And they're not. The only people who bear real fruit, fruit that glorifies the Lord, are branches, Christians, that stay connected to the vine. It's the only way you're gonna bear fruit. And all up and down our valley here, man, we got almond farmers and walnut farmers and my friend Joe was a, as a, a grape farmer. That branch is now done. No more grapes. No more almonds. No more walnuts. No more peaches. 
It's done producing fruit. The only branches that are going to produce fruit are the ones that Joe leaves on the vine. Or Mr. Heinrich leaves on the vine. Only ones. Oh, this still looks pretty. A branch can still come to church. A branch can still kind of bud. You can take it and stick it in some water for a while. It looks pretty and give it to a friend. But there will come a moment when they're throwing it in the trash because it ain't gonna look pretty anymore. Once, once it's off the vine, it's done. Jesus makes this really simple. At the moment you gave your life to Jesus, you're now connected to him. And as long as you stay connected to him, it's a win. Once you disconnect yourself to him, you're done. And I began to think about some of the things that disconnect us at times. Sometimes it can be our spouses. I know some guys and gals over the years here where the guy really wanted to walk with God and do things, come to church, give, whatever. The girl wanted the same thing, but the husband didn't. You know, I'm done with God. I don't want anything to do with God. And boy, it just the influence of a spouse, they're disconnected. It could be a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Boy, they'll, they'll disconnect you in a hurry. I'll tell you one that does it, probably more than anything, is a career. Oh, a career will disconnect you. A lot of things will disconnect you. Now remember, this is a story about producing fruit. You can be disconnected and be a believer. You're still a Christian. You're just not gonna produce any fruit. But at any moment, the beautiful thing about God is he can stick you back in, in the vine. So let me give you, as I wrap this up, um, three things that'll keep you connected. Three things, and these are no-brainers. We all know this, but I'm gonna reiterate them anyway. And the first one is this, you gotta spend time in the Word of God. You gotta you got read this thing and, I don't know, study this thing, you gotta memorize it, meditate on it, and especially you gotta do it. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you just read it and memorize it and study it and you don't do it, it's, it's nothing. It's just, <laughs> it just accomplishes very little. You show me somebody who spends time in this book daily and I'll show you somebody who's still connected. Uh, it was uh, um, 16 months ago, it was a January, I was preaching in here and I told everybody one of the goals I had for January and that was I wanted to listen to the word of God. I've read the word of the whole Bible many, many times, but I'd never listened to the whole thing. And so I told everybody, hey, this year, my goal is I wanna listen to the, the Bible, kind of, kind of a thing, listen to the whole thing. So every morning except for Sundays, I take a, um, a walk, a long walk. And it's early in the morning, and the first 20 minutes of the walk, I listen to, through my Bible app to the scriptures, and I started in the New Testament. So I went Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all the way through Revelation, you know. Then I, I got around to, to, to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, Saturday, yesterday, I finished. I got to the end of Malachi. Now, it took me 16 months. I was hoping to do it in 12. And part of it was, I didn't, I didn't know how many, you know, when you're listening to it, I didn't know how to break it up, you know, right? And so I just would listen and stop. And, you know, I just kind of didn't figure it out right. And I, I'm not mad because I didn't make it in a year, but I, I set a goal. And I listened to the whole thing. Now, tomorrow... I don't know what I'm going to do for the first 20 minutes. Got to figure this out. Maybe I'll go, I'll go through it again. I, I don't know. Because for 16 months, I knew what I would do. 
I'd listen to the word. Now, obviously, I'm reading the word and at times, but let me tell you, there's no, there's no getting around the word. You can't get around it. You want to stay connected, bear fruit kind of thing. It, it, this is critical. Jesus said, man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You gotta have food, you gotta have some bread, but we don't live on that alone. Our, our souls need this. And so spend time in this. And for some of you, you might say, oh man, I don't know, man. Hey, you know, hey if you've never like woke up in the morning and, and read scripture, do, do this, do this. I'm not gonna ask you to read a chapter. I'm not gonna ask you to listen to it for 20 minutes. I don't want you to go from like nothing, 20 minutes. I'm gonna do that. Start tomorrow, wake up and read one passage, just one. John chapter one, verse one. Pastor told me, just one. Just do that. One's better than nothing. You can all do one, right? And it could be, you know, I don't know, maybe you get your coffee and you go, John chapter one. Verse one. I'm gonna go for it today. I'm gonna double up. I'm doubling up. Okay. Read verse two. Yeah. And tomorrow, if you go, whoa, whoa, man, I almost didn't make it to work reading two verses. You know, go back to one. Go back to one. But maybe, maybe, maybe you'll make it. Maybe you'll go, hey, man, I was able to get in the shower and brush my teeth and comb my hair and do all the stuff I need to do and get to work by writing two verses. But if you can, if that overloads you, then just go back to one. I'm not asking you to read a whole chapter at once, but you gotta start in the word of God. N number two, you gotta spend time talking with God. That's just praying. So first 20 minutes, I'm in the Word, listening to it. The next 20 minutes, I, as I'm walking, I got my dogs. I, I, I want to pray for my wife. And, da, 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 things are going on. I, I pray for my kids. You know, da, 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 da. I pray for their spouses. Da, da, da. I pray for my grandkids. You know, I always spend time every day praying for Pastor Joel. And, da, 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 da. and I pray for the elders of our church. Da, 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 da. And then sometimes God, for whatever reason, brings you to my mind. Some of you, I don't know why. I, I don't know why. Sometimes I go, ooh, man, really? Why'd you bring that guy to my mind? I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna think about that guy, but I don't know, just, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> Edit that, okay? Anyway, um, <laughs> I pray for some of the things that are going on, pray for AB 22, 23. I just spend some time talking to him. And some of you who live in my neighborhood, you've come up on me as I'm walking. And I know what you're thinking. You're going, yeah, poor Pastor Rick, he's lost it. <laughs> he's, he's, his, his mind is finally cracked because I'm, I'm, ta I'm just, yeah, man, come on, God, really? It's, you're letting that go down? I don't, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Help me, God, I don't know, you know, whatever. And somebody, will, you know, they're walking their dog and they'll see me and, you know, they shoot across the street. <laughs> there, there's that crazy homeless guy who's just weird, man. You don't have to, you know, get on your knees in a closet somewhere. You just, you know, just walk around and talk. When you're driving, turn your radio off when you're driving on your way to work and just talk to God. And the third thing is you gotta spend some time fellowshipping with, with the people of God, okay? Isn't there, just, isn't there just something powerful about this? Showing up here on Sunday? And you, you know, you, you, you see people you haven't seen in a long time. Hey, how's it, hey, how was your week? Da, da, da. And here's the deal, I, I, I hear this all the time. Yeah, Big Valley's too big. It's too big, what are you talking about? You know, psychologists have figured out that you can only get to know about 15 people. That's it. That's it. So when you come to a big church like this, you get to pick which 15 you want to hang out with. <laughs> if you go to a little tiny church that only has 15, you're stuck with those 15. You, you got no choice who you're going to hang with. Here, 
You can look around and go, wow, there are all kinds of people here. Huh? I, I'm a, these people, I like these people. I like weirdos. I did, did, did. You, you get to choose. Unbelievable. But I watch some of you. And I see you, and oh man, you see your friends, and there's just something great about it. You're laughing, we're hugging. You say, hey, hey, how you doing? You don't do that with everybody because you don't know everybody. But there's something powerful about getting together. Our men's ministry on Monday nights and Tuesday, man, they come in here, they got their tables, hey man, they're talking, Joe, Frank, how you doing? Women's, CR, in a little bit, some of you are going to go over to prime time. Man, you're going to get in and there's tables and they're just talking. And you, 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 Lee, it's hard to get them calmed down at times. They're just talking. And, yeah, and Lee's up there trying to do announcements. All right, everybody get, hey, everybody be quiet. Because everyone's just enjoying each other. But then there's always these times, whether it's in your home group, where you talk about the word and you pray. Look, you do those three things, just spend time in the word. Spend time talking to God and fellowship. You'll never be this. Never. You'll always be this. Three simple things. Now, it's not a comprehensive list of all the things. Just three simple things. But if you're not in the word, you're not talking to God, and you're not fellowshipping, this is you. You look pretty. But you're basically useless for the kingdom. Because Jesus says you can do nothing apart from me, branch. Nothing. He's telling us something valuable here that you gotta stay connected. Everybody stand up. Let me pray and Pastor Brandon's gonna come and we're gonna end with a great song here, okay? So Lord, thank you for your goodness to us and Thank you, God, for this little tiny story. It's just so simple. Thanks, Jesus, for your, your, your goodness to us, using us. I get to see a lot of people here that are connected to you, and man, they're producing incredible fruit. Lord, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you, Jesus, and I pray this in your name. Amen.